Good evening and welcome to this tutorial on water diversion. You can see the definition of water diversion there on the screen and it's quite a broad definition. Um, it includes dams, aqueducts, holding ponds, irrigation ditches, pipes, channels, um, our own Lock Raven Reservoir is an example of diverting water from its natural flow into a body of water that's usually used for some uh, purpose by humans. That can be as simple as drinking water, uh, could be as elaborate as hydroelectric power. Um, most often it's used for uh, irrigation and to have a, um, a, a known supply of water uh, for an organization, for an area. So we're going to talk a little bit about water diversion and um, some of its uh, benefits and some of its drawbacks for the environment. Now this is a typical uh, diagram of a hydroelectric dam and this is from page 317 of your textbook and you can see that on the left are some benefits of dams they provide year-round drinking water and recreation they can uh, be used to uh, produce hydroelectric power they can control flooding downstream and they can provide farmers with a steady supply of water for agriculture those are all good things However, um, on the downside, dams can um, flood land behind the dam that used to be um, agricultural land or villages or towns or simply land that belonged to other people. Um, they can destroy um, uh, the hydrology of an area so that any animals that were living in a flowing system now have to adapt to a alentic or a still water kind of pond lake system. Um, the dam itself can uh, interfere with the flow of nutrients and sediment downriver. Um, they can also interfere with migration of fish spawning upriver. And if the dam ever fails, then there's a considerable con uh, concern, obviously, for flooding downstream. So dams, uh, as kind of the major water diversion uh, instrument that humans build, have some positives and they have some negatives. Let's look at uh, a, the construction of a dam and how it works. So here is kind of a cross section, and this picture is also from page 317 of your textbook. You can see that on the left is the reservoir, or the pond or lake of water that's going to be created behind the dam. On the right side of your screen is the spillway or the flowing part of the water coming out of the dam and traveling downstream toward you know the ocean or another larger river. Um, so the dam is constructed and usually there's an intake somewhere in the dam. Some dams are designed to have water flow over them as well but a lot of dams just have an intake and um, that water will travel through the intake it'll spin a turbine which then is connected to a powerhouse and that powerhouse has uh, some machinery that will convert that spinning energy into electrical energy which is then transmitted by power lines away from the dam to customers. Um, the water then continues through the dam and out the, uh, the outflows uh, where it continues its travels. So you can see how a dam would be an obstruction to any animal migrating upstream because they can't travel through the dam without being harmed by the turbine and also an impediment for any animals or anything moving downstream. You can see um, on the bottom of the, uh, of the dam there uh, you've got sediment here. You can see you've got sediment here, right? And that's building up on the bottom of the, the dam. And if that sediment were to build up all the way to the intake, then you would have problems for uh, the dam as a functional source of hydroelectric power because that sediment would begin to block the intake and reduce the flow of water. Um, some dams, like Conowingo Dam here in Maryland, are having problems with just uh, that sediment buildup. It also restricts that flow of sediment downstream. That sediment carries nutrients um, and are necessary for downstream habitats. Uh, so that can be a concern with dams. Um, as far as animals moving upstream, they often get stopped here because the water is very turbulent. And you can see it's scouring the bottom here 
uh, and that can be a problem for uh, the stability of the dam, but it also could be a problem for any animals trying to move upward. This area of the river is actually very turbulent, and any animals that were not used to that kind of energy on the bottom no longer will live in this spillway uh, below the dam. Some dams have gotten around this problem by uh, their engineers installing fish ladders or fish elevators. They work a little differently. Fish elevators basically have fish swim into a cage or a contraption, which is literally lifted up and then dumped um, into the reservoir on the other side. Uh, a fish ladder uh, has a structure that usually uses a system of uh, levels or steps that fish can jump from one to the other. Um, usually this is done for fish that are used to migrating upstream over rocks or turbulent areas like salmon. And those fish can basically literally climb up the dam level by level, little by little, until they get over the dam and go by. Uh, they work better for shallower dams, shorter dams, uh, and fish that are used to migrating in that way. The elevators are used more for fish that are seasonally migrating so that the dam operation does not have to run that all the time. Um, and then uh, uh, the, um, you know, the operators basically lift the fish um, over, over time there. I want you to look a little bit closely at uh, a particular dam to kind of get an, issue, an idea of some of the concerns with it. Um, this is the Three Gorges Dam project, which is about to finish in China. I can see the, the location of the dam is right here, that little gray line right on the Yanks River uh, in China. The Yanks River, you can see, is quite, the, the, quite a large river. It's the large blue line um, that empties into a estuary right near Shanghai. It begins way up in the Tibetan Plateau in the Himalayan Mountains and drains a better part of the uh, Himalayas and then into a very fertile area here. Um, but it's very prone to flooding. Uh, and uh, it has a, a large seasonal rain volume, so it's not flowing the same way all the time. And so a large, massive project has been uh, proposed for this. And so uh, take a look at the link uh, to this presentation that I have uh, placed uh, on Net Classroom and on my YouTube site, and um, you can take a look at this dam and then come back to this presentation uh, in a little bit. So, I hope you enjoyed the Yanks River uh, Three Gorges Dam video, and I hope it was very insightful for showing you a variety of issues surrounding the construction of that dam, both benefits to doing it, but also the drawbacks to the people living along the Yanks River uh, to the construction of that massive hydroelectric project. There are some similar projects going on here in the United States that I want to briefly talk about before I conclude tonight. Uh, the first is the Colorado River, and this vignette is uh, on page 318 and 319 of your textbook. And it's an important one because we talked about it a little bit uh, already uh, with your uh, most recent free response question. Uh, the Colorado River is uh, uh, about, about 2,300 kilometers long, 1,400 miles long, and it flows through seven states. And... Um, drains, uh, you know, at least its watershed flows through seven states, and it drains a better portion of the um, uh, American Southwest. Uh, its water is used for drinking. Its water is used for recreation. Its water is used for um, hydroelectric power, but most notably the water has been used for agriculture in a very dry and otherwise arid area. Uh, Fourteen dams, um, some of which are pictured on this map, uh, stop the water. And the concern is the river no longer flows to the Gulf of California. And there are a number of reasons for this that are listed uh, in your textbook that I'll kind of review just briefly. Number one, uh, the area is very dry, so there's not a lot of water to recharge this river. Secondly, uh, the river doesn't flow very strongly to begin with. Third, uh, legal pacts that were signed back in the, in the 1920s and 1940s basically have given people the rights to withdraw more water than the river actually supplies. So there's no regulation that will keep water use below water supply. And lastly, um, the water has dropped so dramatically 
um, because uh, several states and the, the nation of Mexico have increasingly withdrawn water for agricultural and urban uses as those land uses have increased in the area. So think of cities like Las Vegas and Boulder and San Diego and Los Angeles and Phoenix and Grand Junction, Colorado. All of these areas that are now metropolitan areas, some of them huge, uh, are now withdrawing water they never did before. And that's become a big problem, uh, especially as we move forward, if uh, global climate change affects the hydrology or the amount of rain this fall this area gets. Um, the Colorado River could fall well below what can supply the needs of farmers and uh, regular citizens in this area. Another concern is the, uh, Col the California Water Project. And here's a picture of that. And this is uh, highlighted on page 320 and 321 of your textbook as well. And this is uh, related to the Colorado because in this case, you have a single state which has done a major diversion of water um, from north to south. The water-rich north part of California in Sacramento and the Shasta Lake area that you see there on the map has plenty of water. The southern areas are dry and arid. Los Angeles, San Diego, Santa Barbara, uh, and the San Joaquin Valley. And so what has been done is a system of uh, aqueducts and, and irrigation ditches basically bring water from the north part of California down to the southern part of California and into Arizona, and even supplement the ailing Colorado. Um, and this has been a big source of debate because um, farmers in the north complain that farmers in the south and citizens in the south are diverting their water and making it harder for them to raise their crops. And so it would be good for you to read over, once again, the California experience on page 320 and 321. So you're familiar with some of the issues um, that uh, Californians are facing due to this giant, massive water transfer project uh, that's going on in the state. One of the solutions to some of these proje projects probably has to do with irrigation because it's the second largest water use, as we've discussed, behind thermoelectric power for fresh water in the nation. And if we can be more conservation-minded as a nation and as a planet with irrigating our, our crops, uh, especially in arid areas, we can use less water and therefore have it last longer and allow for more natural recharge. So there are three uh, methods uh, listed here. Those are described um, in your textbook on pages 324 and 325. Um, the first one is gravity flow, allowing water to flow into a, the, a field as needed from a river that's been dammed or uh, levied uh, nearby or maybe even a small stream. Uh, it's not as efficient because that sitting water you see sitting in the in the areas here, um, this sitting water here, uh, can evaporate. And the, and if it's if the if the river if the field sorry is flooded, then that water will uh, will not be, be be utilized by the crops, but it will be uh, um, wasted. But if you if you flood the field at a adequate flow, uh, the water can flow between the crops, circulate into their roots, and uh, be provided where it, where it's needed. The second method, drip irrigation, is probably the best method, and this is very important. It's a, often a common question that I ask and others ask uh, about the best method to irrigate crops. Uh, this is basically a system of above or below ground pipes that are delivered to individual plants. So you're not watering ground that you don't have uh, crops planted on. Um, and it delivers water exactly to the place where it needs to go and eliminates, usually, evaporation. So then this, these pipes have a network of holes in them that allow the water to seep out into the ground near the roots. You can see here in the trees, it's great because the tree itself does not need to be watered. What needs to be watered are the roots. And the, water, the roots that are taking up the water are not the ones right near the trunk of the tree, but the ones that extend out from it. So that's where the water is supplied, and it gravity feeds down through the ground and waters those roots that are taking the water in. The last method is center pivot. Um, and this is uh, really efficient if you cup, couple it with LEPA sprinklers. LEPA is an acronym which stands for Low Energy Precision Application Sprinklers. Uh, and these are a way of... Um, spraying water closer to the ground and in, and in larger droplets than the center pivot system. And so that water uh, goes right to the crop, it uh, soaks right in, 
and it doesn't get sprayed on areas of the of the uh, field that don't need water. And uh, of course, the center pivot can be adjusted by the farmer to only spray water when it's needed. Uh, so he can avoid spraying and wasting water during very hot parts of the day when plants aren't taking water up anyway. And you also can um, spray water, you know, at, at t only the times of the year when you're growing crops and require that. Another uh, innovation is dry water, and this is basically um, putting in chemicals into the soil. They're almost like gels that when you get them wet will hold water and then gradually dehydrate and release that water into the soil. It's almost like mixing uh, soil with jello and it, it basically holds water and then it re releases it slowly. And these are some other ways that we might be able to irrigate um, without having to waste as much water and be more mindful of it. So these are some issues surrounding um, water diversion. Hope you enjoyed the lesson and uh, look forward to a short quiz tomorrow on what you've learned. Have a great night.